So it really goes back to business fundamentals of being like, what problem are you trying to solve? Yeah. Some of the most, I think, exciting stuff happening in blockchain is actually happening in enterprise, but the blockchain industry doesn't really talk about it because it's not we're like it's not sexy, it's not fun this to talk about like so is a safe place Are we here? To talk Can we talk that? about the sexy yes. stuff happening let's in talk enterprise about the sexy technology? Enterprise blockchain. Okay, let's go. Welcome to Lenovo Late Night IT, where I sit down with the top minds in the tech industry for candid conversations about how technology impacts humanity. I'm your host, Baratunde Thurston, and tonight we're talking about the blockchain. How can businesses use it to solve real world problems? What are the biggest impediments to adoption? And should you go all in on that meme coin your Uber driver told you about? No, no you should not. We've got the one and only Trisha Wong with us tonight. Trisha is a tech ethnographer, data designer, community organizer, and all-around multi-hyphenate badass who believes that technology must serve humanity and not the other way around. She's the co-founder of Sudden Compass, a consulting firm working with Fortune 500 companies and tech startups from Spotify to P&G and Google. Most recently, she co-founded the Crypto Research and Design Lab, which champions humanity-centric Web3 ecosystems that deliver social impact through crypto and blockchain-enabled technology. Joining her is Nikhil Raguvira. Nikhil is head of strategy and innovation at the Celo Foundation, a nonprofit organization supporting the development of the Celo blockchain. Now, Celo is a layer one protocol with a mobile-first architecture and a rich ecosystem of global partners building Web3 applications in support of creating a more inclusive and regenerative global financial system. Nikhil, Trisha, I want to talk about the basics. Blockchain is something a lot of people have heard about, very few people understand. From each of you, I want your definition. What is blockchain? Nikhil, let's start with you. Sure, yeah. So a blockchain starts with a, um, a decentralized ledger. Okay. Right? So that's the core architecture of what we're building. And then it really has kind of three fundamental pieces when we talk about what is a decentralized ledger. And so the first piece is kind of shared consensus. So how do you have agreement between different people around what is on that ledger? Okay. The second piece is on an append-only database. You know, if we think of normal databases, you can just kind of move data around, you can delete things. You can change values. Exactly. Yeah. But in this case, it's an append-only system. So that's you can essentially only what- add to it. Exactly, that's why yeah. it's called a blockchain. It's because you have individual data inputs that are separated out as blocks. Right. And you're basically creating a chain of that. Then the last one is that it's a decentralized ownership of that. So that means okay. that everyone has access to that blockchain in terms of essentially having ownership over that, having that in their system. So if we take a traditional company or a traditional database system, mm -hmm. you, know, you might have servers that are all located in one specific location and all the data is there. But in this case, for a blockchain, it's actually owned by all the different people who are part of that blockchain itself. I think I kind of get it. Thank you for that. Trisha, do you have anything to append to that definition? I have something to append. I have a really simple definition, which is, first of all, when you hear the word blockchain, it sounds so like magical, mythical now, yes. especially with how it's built up. But really, it's just an advanced agreement machine. And it's just kind mm. of like how AI is like an advanced sorting machine. And of course, it like does you know a lot of fancy stuff. But all the blockchain is doing is saying, hey, like we have so much data now, but in a world where you don't really maybe know who your parties are, who you're transacting with, how do we actually trust that we made an agreement? So all it is, it's saying that like we can organize the data in blocks in such a way that you can verify and trust that. And the way it's doing that is like through this decentralized, uh, decentralized way. And a lot of people talk about blockchain, but oftentimes the thing they're talking about, especially in enterprise contexts, yeah. are distributed ledger technology. So mm. it's distributed, but not necessarily decentralized. And so th that's something we can explore later. Yeah. But really, it's just like advanced, you know, advanced agreements. Advanced and we need that because in a yeah. world where we have so much data and so many parties yeah. transacting and being online, we do have to figure out how do we agree to something. It reminds me when I think about access to technology, even simple databases like writing down a text. It was like monks. It was a handful of people in a tower, and they had to agree. They were copying the same thing, but most of the public wasn't involved in that. Now that exactly. everyone can be online, everyone can generate and access data, how could we forge agreement amongst all yes. these parties without centralizing the ownership of that agreement machine? Yep. I love that. Yeah. Why should we care? 
I think we need to care because the way anything gets done in humanity is we have to make agreements. This is history. This is what we do as a society. And we have wars or we have peace because of agreements, mm. right? And if agreement gets upended and without someone knowing, someone's going to be like, screw you. Why did you do that? Now, when in a society where everybody is online, we have a digital humanity now. We have to figure out new ways to make agreements and track them and figure out when someone is trying to like upend an agreement without me knowing. And so I think that's why, you know, something like the blockchain is very, very important technology of figuring out where does it fit into the layer of our society for how we come to make decisions. Did you just promise world peace through blockchain? Perhaps. <laughs> if we could all be decentralized in a purely decentralized yeah. world. Nikhil, especially for uh, a technology leader, you know, someone who's in an enterprise organization, why should they care about blockchain? I think it uh, fundamentally changes the way you can think about a transaction and the way you think about what a, how a business works. Um, so if we take of all the way traditional businesses are done and traditional decision making is done, yeah. it's always led by one central entity. And blockchain, to Trisha's point, is actually how you can basically have a shared global consensus, mm. right? That's something that's very difficult to normally do. You basically built out a technical architecture to do that. And that's really powerful from a business standpoint because it allows you to be able, basically be able to do other fundamental things that you couldn't do otherwise. And we can kind of go into more details yeah. for those different types of pieces of what different types of organizations can do, but it allows you to just have an entirely different business model. Yeah. And so that's really where it becomes really powerful. So I want to get into kind of the range of what blockchain actually enables, what it's better at, what it's worse at. And the thing that most of us know about is cryptocurrency. You know, the Satoshi white paper kind of gave birth to this philosophy, and that was about making a digital system of cash. Do you think cryptocurrency is the least interesting thing one could do with blockchain, or how do you rank it amongst the spectrum? And then we'll get into that spectrum. I think it's one of the most interesting okay. things. And the reason why is, let's first start with Bitcoin, right, to, to your point. You had the ability of creating a new currency that can be adopted by anyone. You basically solve a mass coordination question around mm -hmm. what currencies can we adopt. When we think of historically, again, it was always down to you know, a Federal Reserve Bank of a country, uh, whichever country that might be, whether that country is facing hyperinflation or not, whether that country even has a functioning financial system or not. And so if at the outset, you had cryptocurrency as Bitcoin basically able to facilitate a global consensus around, hey, what if we have a different currency? Okay. But then there's another piece too on cryptocurrency that it can also be used for a lot of different types of transactions and a lot of different utilities. Cryptocurrency isn't just simply a form of money. I mean, if we think of money, it really serves three purposes, right? It's a global account, a store of value, and a, a medium of exchange. Okay. And cryptocurrency, one, can service that, mm -hmm. but then you can do a lot more with it. You can build out entire programmable pieces of how can you have automated contracts, for example. How do you have ownership over different assets? How can you better connect with different individuals? And so cryptocurrency facilitates all of that. Without cryptocurrency, it becomes really difficult to be able to do those kinds of things. Sounds like a financial system, but also a pseudo social le system. legal system and social yeah, system. Yeah, you can have yeah. a, a legal system, a social system. I think we're only at the really kind of at the very initial stages of what you can do with cryptocurrency. Yeah. So I, I want to get past the crypto thing, the currency side of crypto, but I want to stay here for one more moment because volatility is something that we've all experienced in the crypto markets over the past year or so. What is your assessment of the true stability and, and relatively lack of volatility in cryptocurrencies versus some of these traditional but still unstable markets? I mean, I think the two big you know, markers that really destabilized cryptocurrency this year were issues of human like fallibility with the power of humans making really bad decisions it was bad business practices mm -hmm. that then you know really crashed the crypto markets so i don't think cryptocurrency is immune to bad actors making bad practices i think the industry we need to do have better in standards better regulation better protocols um, to prevent these kind of you know to prevent the kind of instability that yeah. you're seeing what do you think about the stability question yeah and i think i think that's Adding on to Trisha's point, if we take stable coins, I think that's right. I think that's fundamental mistakes that were made in an economic design for how are you thinking about a stable coin. And I think talking to folks in the industry, some of these you actually could have predicted. I think it was you look at the model for how a stable coin is built, you can say, wait, is it backed? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing as with a bank, right? If you have a bank. And a stable coin is something that's pegged to, to like the dollar, for dollar example. Fiat currency. And so we saw that uh, earlier this year with uh, with Terra, the their UST stable coin, yeah. where the question is, is is there enough sufficient backing so that if someone wants to redeem their stable coin for one dollar of US dollar, do can they the do cash? that? Yeah. Exactly, do you have the cash? And I don't think it's any different if we think of kind of a traditional bank where if you have a bank run, 
uh, and you don't have enough cash, which yeah. most banks don't. They've mostly lent it out. I think that was kind of that same problem that we've seen in traditional finance kind of pan out again in crypto here as well. Yeah. And then if we take up kind of the broader world of cryptocurrencies, I think all of these are still very early. You don't have large amounts of adoption at the end of the day, which means that they are going to be volatile. Right. right? If you have yeah. global adoption by everyone, then your value is going to be a little bit more stable. But if not, they're going to be subject to wild movements especially as kind of adoption changes, and a lot of them are used as more as like speculative assets than anything else. Right. And if you look at cryptocurrency, I would say like, you know, it's a new field, but if you look at the history of mortgages, it was really unstable. There was so much scams mm. happening when the whole mortgage industry was being built. Yeah. And so, but when the subprime mortgage crash happened in 2008, the whole, the world did not say, oh, away with mortgages. Like that whole thing, people are yeah. no longer gonna own, own homes and we're gonna have to find a whole new way. No, we said, we're gonna have to do better regulation and better regulation happened. Hmm. And this is what's gonna have to happen here. The industry is moving fast. And instead of asking for forgiveness, you know, or and then later on, you know, people's lives being ruined, we actually have to figure out these things ahead of time and get regulators really smart and not just like tech bros in, but we yeah. need everyday people who are fixing stuff to say, okay, this is actually not just like an industry for, you know, randos who care about technology. This is a new social construct that we the, have to uh, regulate. The, the corollary to asking for forgiveness is ironically asking for permission on the front end <laughs> in a system that's supposed to be permissionless. Exactly. So there is, there is still some tension there. But I want to move past the money part and think about what else, I mean, we have this recent study showing that 94% of business executives feel like they need to have a blockchain strategy. They may not know what that means. They may be watching us right now. What might that mean? Hi, business Hi. leader. Yes, I'm looking <laughs> at you, IT person. What might that mean in terms of practical uses, either as a substitute for something they already have deployed or as a, a new way to do something different that they haven't tried before? Why blockchain and what's possible with it? I mean, I've been consulting for so many years for CDOs and yeah. CTOs. So this is reminiscent of what happened with big data is that for years people were like, well, you know, Gartner, this latest study shows that like 95% of like CTOs and CIOs are like, you have to, we have to have big data in our strategy and we have to have a big data plan. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, but why do you need big data? And they'd be like, I don't know. I was told by the board that this is this thing <laughs> and we need to do it. Yeah. And we're hearing the same thing with AI. And then it's now the same thing with blockchain. Yeah. And so it really goes back to business fundamentals of being like, why, what problem are you trying to solve? Yeah. Some of the most, I think, exciting stuff happening in blockchain is actually happening in enterprise. But no, the blockchain industry doesn't really talk about it because it's not more like it's not sexy. It's not fun this to talk about like is blockchain. a safe place to talk about Are we here? Can we talk that? about the sexy yes. stuff happening let's in enterprise technology? Let's talk about the sexy technology? enterprise blockchain. Ooh. Okay, let's go. But that's I think that's where the interesting case studies are happening. But we need the CTO and CDI, CDO when you're getting that question from your, your board. You have to go back to the business leader, leaders and say, what what challenges is the business you know dealing with? What could we do faster or yeah. better? What could we de-risk if we were able to use this distributed and perhaps decentralized technology? Hmm. Another one is I've seen a lot of exploration on supply chain management. How can you think about traceability from a supply chain standpoint? If you have a shared ledger for that, that anyone, any one of your partners can kind of automatically update and you have shared ownership over that. It's a huge amount of transparency that you get. Right. And then I think you have other types of things of how can a company or a, how can a company engage closer with customers? And so we've seen a lot of NFT projects that have essentially tried to do that. But mm. again, is it a genuine attempt or is it something that is like, oh, slap an NFT on there and people will buy it? That's not good. And I think the crypto industry has done that poorly. Yeah. And I think the similarly, I think it's making sure that there's intention around, wait, why are you doing an NFT? What's the real purpose here? Is there really another problem that you're trying to solve? Mm. And is NFT the right way to do it? Or is there a better way to do it? Uh, from a transparency standpoint, we have separate from healthcare, you also have a lot of kind of climate action, okay. especially by large corporations. Yeah. Right? They say in their corporate reporting, oh, you know, we are doing carbon offsets. Right. But you don't know what quality those offsets are. And so that's another piece of that transparency and the traceability of having that on a blockchain. So you can see the amount of transactions that have happened within a company, link that to the actual carbon impact, mm -hmm. and then see where is that exactly going. Is that a place that is actually generating real value for carbon offsets, or is it something that isn't really doing much? And so there's a lot of that transparency you can also look at from a use case. This reminds me uh, of a company you and I are both connected to in some way, Trisha. You're formerly on the advisory board. My wife and I are also you know, working with this company, Reseed, and you're talking about carbon, and this involves verification and quality.
Can you explain what Reseed does and what the blockchain component of that is in terms of verifying real carbon? Yeah, so Reseed is one of my favorite examples of really an innovative way to apply blockchain technology as part of the stack. Their whole goal as a business is to bring a new type of carbon to market. And this new type of carbon to market comes from small farm shareholders. Okay. Because currently right now, all the carbon that you see that companies are buying come from, you know, maybe forest or like large agro, you know, farmlands. And that means that all the, the billions of stewards of land, of farms, you know, people who grow vegetables and are feeding our society, mm -hmm they cannot participate in this carbon market. Even though what they do on their farms is naturally sequestering carbon, exactly. right? Can you think of any uses for blockchain in the retail space? What would that mean? There's a ton. Mm -hmm. uh, so a good retail use case would be something like NFT rewards. Okay. Uh, and we've seen a lot of that in terms of kind of like loyalty points. You're receiving an NFT that shows that you're buying something mm -hmm. from them. And that that's might, a receipt, basically. Exactly. <laughs> and you can redeem that. So you've seen some of those kinds of use cases yeah. as well. Any other retail? I think, you know, with NFTs, it's really just this amazing tool to build community. And we're just seeing the tip of how um, retail brands are going to use it to build uh, loyalty. Because, you know, up until now, how do you stay in touch with people who are fans of, you know, your, email, right? Email. That's it. <laughs> we don't have many options. All right. So there is so much, uh, how do I put this gently, but honestly, scammage in this space. There's a lot of terminology we don't understand. There's a lot of, um, I'm gonna make money in this by beating someone to it and selling it at a higher price later, so speculation. And as the bubbles can burst every few years around the ICO, initial coin offering craze in 2017 or 2022, the kind of collapse of some of these markets, it weeds out some of those people and others remain. I guess my, my question here is, how real is blockchain and the things that we're building on it in terms of the maturity of the whole space? Do you feel like it's 80% noise and 20% signal? Do you feel like it's 20% noise and 80% signal? And where are we in the journey? Because it's very confusing and a little scary looking from the outside in, I'm sure, for a lot of people. I would say it's scary for someone in this space too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I think 80-20 rule is right. I think there's 80-20, yeah, like 80% of what you generally hear, I think is is shilling at the end of the mm. day. Okay, uh, I agree with that. I was yeah. gonna say, is it 80? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which, no, what's the 80, 80. yeah. 80% 80 yeah. I think is shilling, and that's quite unfortunate because yeah. it ends up being highly speculative, but no one really says, hey, what, what is a specific asset that I'm about to buy? It's meant to serve some utility, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, like take any, like blockchain, like layer one blockchain token, Ethereum, ETH, Solana, Sol, Celo, Celo, any of those assets. It's actually meant to serve some core functional activity. That was what it's designed for. Yeah. But then what we've seen is kind of a breakage of that where instead you see the value of tokens go up above what utility might provide. Yeah. And that becomes a problem, right? Because then you have a hype train. I wanna shift our energy a little bit. We have a lot of confusing terminology and I wanna test your knowledge of them with a game a game that figures out what's on your mind. We're gonna give you some cards. The cards will have funky blockchain related terminology on them. You hold that card up and the other person shouts out clues to help you identify them. So uh, we're gonna start this game, Nikhil. I will have you hold up your cards first. Don't start until I say so. And we will start in three, two, one. Go for it. Oh, this is the person who made Satoshi. Bitcoin. Boom, nice, <laughs> all right. Oh, flip, you can keep it flipped down. And then do I go next? Or no, keep, keep going. going. Oh, We're in a rapid fire. Oh, um, Celo is a... Proof of stake blockchain? Protocol that is a... Layer one? Yes. Ooh, good, good. Um, this is how Bitcoin is verified. Proof of work. Nice. Yes. Smooth, fast. Um, this is a way um, the consensus algorithm to... SHA-256. When you need to prove that a transaction in a block, you need to put it, you need to... Consensus? Um, Potatoes. I would like to have, mmm, it rhymes with mashed potatoes. Um, mash. <laughs> like, oh, you're so close. Uh, mashed potatoes. The album, this is, you might have to um, move on. What is SHA 256 algorithm? Um, the consensus. You got How do you five know you bash something? Um, the input key to private key. Smash? Key. What? No. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Got Let's stuck work on it out. Let's work it out. <laughs> That's it. We're out of time on that. That was fun to watch. Painful, but fun. Uh, <laughs>
smash. The I mashed love that. potatoes threw me off. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> you got you started thinking about food. No, I was like, focus, very focus. Close. All right, we're about to switch roles. Oh, I'll count the, you in. Um, so, Trisha, you're gonna start holding up words okay. in three, Do me good. two, okay. one, go. Uh, it's not. Uh, so it's it, uh, it, Ethereum does the cello. You answered it earlier. For sake. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Um, Ethereum's a layer one. Then you also have. Um, layer twos? Yeah. Okay. Yes, okay, let's move it. Uh, these are the ones who basically ensure that a transaction is... Validators. Yeah. Great. Uh, pass. It's gonna take two. <laughs> oh, I could've totally... I know, but... <laughs> okay, so, uh, ETH is used on this to pay for... ETH is used on a protocol? ETH is used on Ethereum to pay for... Pay for NFT. How is the um, gas? Yeah, there you go. Ooh, all right. Ten seconds. Uh, Circle does this. Stable coins. Yep. Uh, Vitalik talked about this. It's a problem in which there's three pieces. Trilemma. Yeah. Whoa, oh, nice. <laughs> That's great. All Woo. right, so you all really do know what you're talking about, <laughs> except the hash potatoes. You clearly don't know what hash potatoes are. I, hash browns, I guess. Hash so browns. That's when I was like, oh, but potatoes. Oh, potatoes okay. Garlic potatoes, mashed potatoes, baked potato. You took them too far out of the world of the blockchain, moment you which said is potatoes, my fault I because I gave you that hint and then it ended up undermining you. Anyway, I think you did a great job. Thanks for playing the game and proving that you are not charlatans and rug pullers. Will there be one chain to rule them all? Or how do we live in a world of multiple chains? Because again, to the decision maker, it feels like vendor selection and incompatibility crops up. So can we live in a multi-chain world? That's been our thesis uh, for from the get-go, is that you'll have different blockchains for different purposes. Okay. You might have a few that are kind of serving as this all-purpose general blockchain. And so there might be these kind of general use cases. Okay. I think looking at it from beyond there, it then starts coming down to what is a different blockchain doing and why would you build on that? There's a technical architecture for why one would build on one blockchain over another. Okay. The same way if we think of, you know, uh, why does someone code in one language over another? Yeah. It's because they're used to it. I don't, I don't even know where the idea of like a single chain to rule them all even came from. Pretty it was fun in, to say. Inane. Yeah. We don't have enough builders in this space that are just from actual communities with domain expertise but we need developers or entrepreneurs, or you know, we need social workers, we need teachers, we need doctors, people from actual fields that where you're serving real people, mm -hmm. real human beings to say, okay, well, what are the problems we're dealing with and where should it get involved in the solution that you're building? Yeah. Part of the problem is layer ones, having all these hackathons, trying to recruit developers and be like, well, now you're part of our layer one. It's like a gang. Yeah, yeah. it is, it is. And, then, it is. <laughs> and it's like people have these ideas like, well, I only build on code on this or that, when really it's like, no, you as a developer should be multi-hyphenate. You should be able to say, I'm here to solve problems. Or yes, I specialize in this chain because of this, but not because like it's better. If you only have one overall blockchain across everything, from a security standpoint, that is risky. You yeah, have it's a monopoly. zero redundancies. Right. It is a monopoly. So if uh, your major protocol on there, if something happens to one specific protocol that's on that one blockchain, you don't have an alternative. Right. And that's really risky. And so that's where it is good to have other mm -hmm. blockchains and ideally be able to seamlessly move across different blockchains uh, for whatever purpose you need. I don't, I don't think we're gonna get to better blockchain technologies for humanity until we get more developers and domain experts from communities building. Because right now, if you look at most um, ha you know, hackathons or conferences in this space, it's mostly, it's very homogenous. Mm. And we need to get people who are from communities who understand the kind of the solutions that they need. Yeah. So one of the things that we've been doing is creating a multi-chain hackathon. We teamed up with Coindesk to do that. And Cello was one of the partners. And we also recruited heavily from communities who ha have never, you know, coded in blockchain before and learned that software, but they were in they really understood the problem. So yeah. the kind of winners that came out of our blockchain were like, you know, indigenous leaders, you know, people from Atlanta or like people who were like, look, you know, um, I my historical, like we have generational financial trauma. We had black developers saying like, you know, we had, you know, we know about Greenwood when, you know, there was a centralized authority and we built up our communities and then it was just taken over. And now we're gonna build new kinds of communities that we can control more easily. And so you really see new kinds of developers and builders coming yeah. into this space when you recruit more widely. And that's when I think we're gonna see um, less scams and shift that 80, 20% to more like, increase the 20% of like what is not shilling, what is like actual real. applications for everyday people. Yeah. 
Thank you both for dispelling some of the myths and finding some of the value in blockchain. I really appreciate it. It was super fun. A ton of fun. Thanks for having us. You got it. And that's it for tonight's episode of Lenovo Late Night IT. Thanks to our guests, Trisha Wong and Nikhil Raguvira for joining us. I'm Baratunde Thurston, and I'll see you next time.